I'm Marshall Kozloff, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. My guest today is Hudson Senior Fellow Michael Roberts. We're here to discuss the state and future of the U.S. maritime industry, both our commercial shipping capacity and the actual shipbuilding capacity the country has at a domestic level. If there is a single industry where the United States finds itself more overmatched than any of the others, it is in the shipbuilding arena. Michael is here to discuss the ways that we could improve from the status quo and address the commercial, industrial, and labor-related issues key to preserving our capacity should there be conflict in the Western Pacific. In the context of an invasion of Taiwan, um, they started out with a, a directive from Beijing that says suspend immediately all uh, trade and transportation involving the United States and Taiwan. And, uh, and, and that order goes out to 6,000 Chinese uh, masters of the ships and, and all of the marine terminals around the world and, and to the company, the parent companies. And they have unique access to information uh, more than any other country uh, about what's in the containers themselves and, 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 the, and the shipping pattern and so on. Um, they would be in a position to do us serious, serious harm in terms of the supply chain. Uh, the supply chains that we've set up and relied upon uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to you know, grow and to, to sustain a healthy economy. Uh, I think what we experienced during the supply chain crunch a couple of years ago would uh, w- would look relatively painless uh, compared to what could happen uh, in that setting in, in terms of weaponizing the supply chains. Hope you all enjoy this conversation. Michael Roberts, welcome to the Arsenal of Democracy. Thank you, Marshall. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to chat with you. Before we get into the maritime industry, I'd love to hear about your role at Hudson and then, of course, how you actually got into this space in the first place. Sure. Uh, I had a, a long career in the maritime industry uh, in um, in both the regulatory and legal and policy area in Washington, D.C. I spent 30 years in Washington um, uh, working on these issues, um, including being very involved in the in the last round of of significant changes in maritime policy in the 1990s, and then uh, at, at a couple of points along the way, I had the chance to go in house with one of the major American shipping companies, uh, Crowley Maritime. A great experience, uh, uh, be, being able to. Uh, uh, learn uh, within the industry itself, as opposed to sort of sitting in Washington and trying to figure it out. It's a great way to to, to learn the industry and the policy issues and and so on. And I, I wound up uh, as a senior uh, on the senior leadership team, uh, general counsel, and uh, and wrapped up that part of the career at the end of uh, 2021. Um, the uh, the couple of years before then, I was the president of the of one of the main maritime coalitions uh, uh, dealing with domestic shipping policy, American Maritime Partnership. And during that time, I became very, very aware of uh, the uh, the challenges that we have as a country with with China's uh, growth and ambitions and and how the maritime industry uh, is is impacted by that. and And so, uh, rather than retire, I decided to continue working on those issues. Uh, had worked with Brian Clark in the in the past, and was able to reconnect with him here at Hudson, and been very head down for the last year and a half, uh, focused on 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 um, really understanding the issues, understanding the the risks that we face, and and trying to come up with some some viable solutions. Yeah, what is so interesting about this topic, and why I'm excited to speak with you, is. I think most folks, even policy-minded ones in the audience, probably don't spend much time thinking about the maritime industry in the first place. So can you just give us a as deep as you want to go explanation of like what is the maritime industry, what are its components, and then what is the overall state of it in the year 2023? Sure, I'd be glad to do that. So so I think of it as sort of c- consisting of two components, shipping shipping services, transportation services, and those are, those are in international and domestic markets. 
uh, and those are separate markets um, that for reasons we don't have to go into today, but that, but they're separate. And then shipbuilding, which is a, a, a different kind of, uh, of, of business, uh, you know, manufacturing uh, long-lived capital assets. Um, in the commercial world, um, uh, they are, uh, it, is, it, is, it is wide open in international trade from a regulatory standpoint. In other words, anybody can do it. Um, and, and the way it has de- evolved over the, over the decades is uh, sort of to a default uh, system called a flag of convenience or open registry system, which uh, basically allows um, any company anywhere in the world to establish a, a ship um, or to register their ship in a particular uh, registry, uh, Marshall Islands or uh, Panama or, or Liberia, um, uh, hire the, 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 the least expensive labor anywhere in the world to sail on that ship. Uh, no connection with those registries per se, other than that they've, they've chosen, chosen to, um, uh, to, to register there. Uh, and, and then compete in international markets, U.S. import-export trade uh, between you know, China and Los Angeles. Um, and, and so that's, that's a very challenging market, and it's a somewhat similar story with shipbuilding. Um, but, but, you know, American workers uh, who are, uh, you know, have the choice to be an airline pilot or a ship captain or a, uh, a, a marine engineer or a, 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 a software engineer or, or do general work around a ship or be an Uber driver, whatever, across the board, American workers are going to be more expensive. Uh, and, and so that uh, has had a major impact on the size of our industry over the years, or our maritime industry over the years. And, and uh, so we've had to come up with policy solutions to deal with that in order to, to retain uh, a critical mass of Americans who know how to build and operate ships. And that's been sort of the, uh, the paradigm that we've been working off of for the last uh, 30 years. And what's interesting here is that, as you point out in your report, um, for decades, separately from just the China geopolitics uh, level question, countries outside the U.S. have dominated shipping and shipbuilding, Japan, Korea, certain uh, European countries. What strategy do these countries use to dominate the space? So uh, in in shipbuilding, uh, the answer is that – that low cost labor was extremely important uh, and still is uh, to some extent extremely important to to being successful and competitive in in international markets uh japan coming out of world war ii really focused on their shipbuilding industry and they built up a very uh sizable one and one that remains competitive because they they have continued to uh, be able to uh innovate and um uh and find the right markets to 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 compete in uh, Korea then followed suit, uh, and and then China, and China has taken it to a whole new level. Uh, it has been a policy of uh, uh, Xi Jinping to really emphasize the maritime industry, shipping and shipbuilding, in ways that really haven't happened um, in 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 our lifetime, um, and the and the results are extremely uh, concerning. They've built a maritime powerhouse, and uh, you know with with the ability to uh, I mean, they are currently between those three countries for shipbuilding, uh, 94, 95 percent of the world's uh, deliveries of commercial ships uh, in the next year will come from those three countries, more than half from China and the other the other from uh, Japan and Korea. So it's it is a, a very, very concentrated uh, market and it's based upon government supports, uh, low cost labor, labor and um uh, and just market positioning, uh, being in, in an export market as China has been and the other countries uh, have been, uh, ha- has enabled them to um, really build up their, their shipbuilding capacity. And then ship, shipping itself, shipping as a service, is uh, uh, driven by um, other factors, it's starting with the cost of the, of the labor on the ship, the mariners. Um, but that largely has been um, uh, p- pushed aside, I would say, in the sense that um, uh, flag of convenience vessels, which dominate international trade, 80% or so uh, of the vessels that carry uh, U.S. imports and exports are, are flag of convenience vessels. They are f- crewed by uh, mariners from all over the world, basically uh, to get the lowest cost and lowest regulatory burden. And that's, um, uh, and that's what's impacted our ability as a country to maintain our maritime industry. So 
um, post COVID, I think policymakers um, and just companies in general are critically aware of the pain and the problematic nature of becoming too dependent um, on foreign countries, foreign companies um, for critical things in the national interest. To what degree is the foreign dominance of this industry and its various aspects a weakness the United States needs to address? So just to back up for a second, I, I'll talk for a second about the numbers. The numbers are, are, are stunning. Um, uh, and this, I would say shipping and shipbuilding, there's no strategic, strategically important industry uh, that, that China is, overmatches America more than in the uh, commercial shipping and shipbuilding industry. Uh, they, they have a fleet of uh, 10,700, 10,800 large commercial ships um, our, uh, that they own. Um, our fleet is, the, the ownership part, part of it is about 1,200. Um, and then we say they have a fleet of around 6,000 Chinese flagged vessels crewed by you know, Chinese captains and mariners, uh, our fleet is around 200 um, total. And half of those are more than half of those are in our domestic market. So the, the overmatch in terms of shipbuilding, in terms of uh, shipping itself is, is extraordinary. And then China has layered on through the Belt and Road Initiative um, control at marine terminals around the world. 96 marine terminals around the world have Chinese, some degree of Chinese control. Um, and we dug deeper into that issue and, and, uh, and found that 23 of the top 25 uh, container ports worldwide uh, include marine terminals where China has uh, uh, either total control because they're based in China, um, and that's more than that's around half of the global uh, throughput of, of container shipping units. Um, um, uh, but, or in, in other countries where there's, there's ownership. And so 23 of the top 25 container ports, uh, have some degree of Chinese control. And that getting back to your question, how does that concern us from a national security perspective? I think it's very, very, uh, concerning in terms of what, how, um, China could manipulate uh, the the supply chain in an adverse way, uh, or or shut it down entirely, as far as the U.S. is concerned. If you just think about uh, how, if in the in the context of an invasion of Taiwan, um, they started out with a, a directive from Beijing that says suspend immediately all uh, trade and transportation involving the United States and Taiwan. And, uh, and, and that order goes out to 6,000 Chinese uh, masters of the ships and, and all of the marine terminals around the world and, and to the company, the parent companies. And they have unique access to information uh, more than any other country uh, about what's in the containers themselves and, 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 the, and the shipping pattern and so on. Um, they would be in a position to do us serious, serious harm in terms of the supply chain. Uh, the, the supply chains that we've set up and relied upon uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to you know, grow and to, to sustain a healthy economy. Uh, I think what we experienced during the supply chain crunch a couple of years ago would, uh, w- would look relatively uh, painless uh, compared to what could happen uh, in that setting in, in terms of weaponizing the supply chains. And I'm curious, maybe there is no equivalent, but could you identify if it exists the golden age of American uh, maritime strength and shipbuilding capacity? Or is there a period we can look to where we had gotten the policy mixed together? Right, right. Well, you'd have to say World War II. We uh, we we had to. Uh, we you know the the U.S. merchant marine was um, you know a key to winning the war. Our ability to build ships quickly, uh, supply ship, ships quickly and, and, and transport uh, uh, military and civilian cargoes um, to, to our allies in, in, in the UK. And, and then when the Soviet Union was our ally in that, in that conflict uh, to, on the Mur- Murmansk run, if that's a familiar uh, concept, uh, we were able to scale up extraordinarily effectively. Um, and and I, I think um, there are certainly lessons uh, from that era uh, that would apply today. But we have to remember the 21st century is very different. Warfare in the 21st century would be very different. Uh, we hope we don't have to find out. Um, a major power warfare would be would be um, an awful thing. But I think we have to be prepared to deter it in all its forms. Uh, and and the notion that um, one of the key uh, uh, 
benefits of having a strong American maritime industry, a strong merchant marine, is the ability to supply our troops uh, in the event of they're deployed. If we can't supply and resupply our troops uh, when they're deployed, uh, we can't um, we can't deploy them in the first place. So that that assured access to a supply chain or to supply lines is um, is critical, and that comes with American crewed vessels uh, on Amer- you know flying the American flag. To stick with the World War II metaphor for a second, the key thing of World War II is that if you look at um, the American military and defense industrial base in 1938, on both counts, we're in a pretty weak space. Um, the point, though, is when the stakes were there, aka, you know, the start of World War II, combined with the political will, and then just the fact that we could just convert our peacetime capacity to a military capacity, we are capable of ramping up in all these various categories. To what do degree is the maritime industry one where one can um, ramp up based on stakes, capacity, and political will? So I, I think it's, it's, it's very possible. Uh, uh, certainly from the, from the maritime, um, it, we have to move. I mean, we can't wait until the, the problem's, you know, uh, right up right up on us if it isn't already, but we can't wait. But we, there, is, uh, there is the ability to scale up and scale up fairly quickly uh, if, if there's a, a recognition that we need to do that and, and, the, and, the, and the political support to get it done. Um, we have in this country, we have preserved uh, a shipbuilding industrial base uh, that's commercial uh, based upon building for U.S. domestic markets, uh, container ships in the offshore trades, and tankers for the for the uh, coastal trades, and and so on, um, and and that uh, that shipbuilding capacity is there. We have expertise. We have we have uh, it's it's very small by world standards, and like everything else, it's expensive to uh, that to do it in in America to build ships in America, uh, but it's there, and that's that is. Um, um, and that can be scaled up. And, and I would say the same for the, for the shipping side of it, the maritime, the mariner side of things. We have a, a, um, you know, 4,000 or so, uh, mariners involved in deep sea commercial trades today. Um, uh, I think that number needs to increase a lot. Uh, but there, but that's, uh, that's, I, in my opinion, that's where we're at. And then the second part before we get to the report itself, um, you keep making reference to um, American crewed ships. Now, if a majority of the current maritime base is in American crewed, where do um, is, is sailor the proper is the, the proper word uh, mariner? Where, where, where do the where do the mariners come from? Um, what does the talent pipeline look like? How long does it take to repurpose someone or to train someone? I'd love you to uh, talk about that side of things. Sure. We have a good uh, in, uh, training infrastructure uh, in the United States. We have the Federal Merchant Marine Academy. We have six state maritime academies. Um, the, the labor unions have their own trading facilities. Um, and, and really the issue, in my opinion, is, is getting more people into that, into those uh, schools and into those training programs. Um, and then, and then out to sea. Um, uh, and, and there's a lot of conversation about how to do that. Workforce development, as you know, in this country is a real challenge with extremely low unemployment and, and, uh, lots of options for people to choose. So, so for us to, uh, to scale up to the degree that we need to, I think we have to set the bar at the right level. Uh, and then we have to, and then we have to go for it. We have to put the resources in. Now I said we, we have 4,000 or so, uh, American mariners in, um, uh, in the deep sea commercial markets. Now we need 10,000. So 10,000, that's yeah, over a five year period. That would be roughly scaling up at the rate of 1200 per year, which, uh, is not a daunting number on the one hand, uh, in the, in the scale of, a you know, of 150 million American workforce. Um, but you know, when the, when the sort of the history for the last 30 years of the industry has been sort of losing ground or, or treading water, uh, to all of a sudden say we're going to grow by those percentages, it, it really is a challenge, and and uh, it takes a, a degree of of uh, focus and resources um, that um, uh, and and will uh, to to get it done. But I but I think it can be done. And the last question before we actually get to the report, um, this is kind of a two parter, but they are related and therefore rememberable. So you've made reference multiple times to a 1990s reset. 
uh, U.S. maritime policy that you were involved with. Um, before, obviously, though, the 1990s, as with most of the categories we discussed in this podcast, you had the, the actual Cold War. So what was the pre-1990s Cold War era maritime policy, broadly speaking? And then what did we reset into during the 1990s that obviously set the stage for our conversation today? So I think the answer uh, in terms of pre uh, end of the Cold War, during the Cold War, um, uh, the maritime policy was kind of on a steady decline, uh, or, or allowed a steady decline to take place. We uh, uh, made decisions after World War II to um, uh, surplus, you know, all of the Liberty ships and the, and the, uh, the all of those ships to to um, foreign owners, and 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 so the U- U.S. Uh, international fleet declined precipitously uh, in the post-Cold War years, and not much was done to hold on to it. Um, so by the end of the, now the numbers are still significant, by the end of the, by the 1980s, we were, we were you know, ranked very low, and, but we still had 800 or 1,000 U.S. flagships. I don't know the exact number there, but, but um, uh, as opposed to less than 200 today. Um, but but I think in the, and it's a similar story in 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 the uh, shipbuilding side of things where um, the, the the government tried uh, uh, subsidy programs to support them. Um, they were not well designed. Uh, they were not um, well executed all the time, and the result was uh, we didn't um, uh, we didn't um, we didn't succeed very well. And by uh, the time Reagan took office in 1982. Um, the or ni- yeah, 1980, 81. Uh, the um, uh, the decision was made to to just cancel the uh, shipbuilding subsidy program um, as opposed to reform it. And I think it should have been reformed, but not canceled. But that's a long time ago. Um, but uh, and then the uh, the the program uh, for operation of ships um, uh, was. Uh, retained uh it was it was slimmed down and then that was what was really reformed in the, when the 1990s came along and then what um was the actual reset that occurred then so in in the 1990s uh, obviously the the cold war was over uh, america was the sole hegemon we were always going to be that um the need for a maritime industry was seriously questioned an american maritime industry was seriously questioned in a lot of quarters so it was really a matter of survival uh for ship american shipping and shipbuilding uh, again understanding the paradigm that we're up against in international markets um and uh and, and so um and, and a general uh, move to uh, to open markets, and so the container shipping industry was deregulated. I had a role in that, writing that legislation. The um, uh, we retained a fleet of uh, what is now eighty five U.S. flagships in international trade, the Maritime Security Act of nineteen ninety six, um, and I had a role in in writing that also. And and uh, but efforts to reform and 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 reinstate uh, shipbuilding subsidies uh, were abandoned. Um, there was some uh, loosening of finance restrictions for for ships in in domestic markets. Um, but but the thrust of the time was you know we'll we'll get this as slim as we possibly can, and uh, and uh, and and so we have something to scale up if we need to. So that is the perfect pivot to where you find ourselves today and your report. So take it wherever you want to go. Sure. So, so I, 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 as I mentioned, I, I felt very strongly that, that uh, the, the, the assumptions that were made in the 1990s when we reset maritime policies no longer applied with, with the emergence of China as a, a, a challenger on, uh, as a global superpower and with the, the decision that uh, Xi Jinping made uh, to, to uh, make China a, a powerhouse, uh, a shipping, a maritime powerhouse. Um, and how that, so I wanted to look into that in, in great detail. And, and I mentioned a couple of the things that I discovered. One is that we don't have the American flag capacity. Uh, we have one third of the capacity we need to uh, uh, resupply troops in a Western Pacific conflict. Um, our, our, the size of our fleet is, again, is based, still based on, for the most part, on, um, on that 1990s paradigm. And that's just not where we're at today. We need 
250 ships, 250 U.S. flag ships crewed by American citizens. And, and that's the, the data is out there. It's not my invention. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's well established. Uh, and that's just to meet core sea lift requirements. Um, and quick and, pause here because I want to make sure, sure this is entirely understandable. Um, we've made reference to we supply do you mean like the u.s merchant marine do you mean private companies are, are things are things nationalized how does the actual ownership structure here work um it's uh, I, i'm referring to we as the american maritime industry uh i think most of the time but um uh yeah the, it's it's a it's a mix of publicly traded private uh and, and private companies um uh, entrepreneurs that uh, get into the business or um or uh, or are otherwise involved in the business and, and, uh, they look for markets that they can serve and, and, uh, uh, and, and sometimes they succeed and sometimes it doesn't work out so well, but it's a very, very entrepreneurial in my, in my experience, a very entrepreneurial group of, uh, of business people. And I, the reason why I'm just curious is let's say that you do have a Western Pacific conflict that necessitates um the sea lift capacity is there is there a switch that's turned and then the industry has to kind of pivot um because once again i think the structural uh, factors here are pretty interesting yeah so so um there is something called a voluntary intermodal sea lift agreement which is the the, the contract that um uh, companies enter into when when they um participate in the in the programs and that that is the switch that is turned in the event of a um uh, of a conflict um uh, and it's it's a it's a sophisticated agreement that has uh, been very effective in terms of of uh, resupplying troops involved in the, the persian gulf wars um, um and and i think that basic program structure works uh, the problem we have, the problem we have with it now, is that it's just too small, um, and 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 the and, and growing it to the extent we need to grow it, um, it, it changes the economics. It changes aspects of the program that are um, uh, that just need attention. I mean, the the economics of the program don't work. Um, uh, when when the amount of cargo that is sort of the one of the linchpins of the current program, you know, when it's spread over 85 ships, which is where we were at the beginning of this year, it's enough to make the make the program work from an economics perspective. When you spread that same cargo or even a little bit more cargo uh, over 250 ships, it doesn't work. So we need to find a new new uh, addition additional ways to make the program economically viable. Um, and, and that's that, that's part of what we're doing. The other thing that I that you know I have worked on, and that is in this report, and that I think is a really significant change, um, is to phase in a requirement that ships in the 250 ship fleet uh, be built in the United States eventually on a phased in basis. Uh, it takes it doesn't take long to reflag a ship from the Liberian registry to an American registry and put an American crew on that. That's doable in a matter of weeks or months or less in, a, in an emergency. Um, but to build a ship and to sort of reconstitute our commercial shipbuilding industry or, or grow it from the base it has today, that's going to take more time. And, and you want to do that on a phased basis so that, uh, so that it's sustainable. And, the, and, and uh, the, what I like about uh, this is that it's a demand signal for the delivery from U.S. shipyards of high technology um, ships that that uh, have you know take care of the crew, give uh, extraordinary safety to the crew. They're, they're they'd be autonomous, ready in case there is a conflict, and we can pull the crew off and 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 have the ship sail on its own. Um, uh, other technologies around that, and then from a propulsion propulsion standpoint, uh, it could be you know alternative fuels, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol. It could be nuclear powered. It could be, there's just lots of options out there. So the idea is that we have, with this demand signal, this consistent demand signal that, that we haven't had in this country uh, in, in decades and decades, it's U.S. shipbuilders haven't had, we again, <laughs> we, um, uh, we have the chance, uh, a real opportunity to um, uh, start a little bit from scratch. I mean, take in the sense that we don't have, you know, legacy systems and legacy um, uh, work processes that are going to slow us down. We can start a little bit uh, on a greenfield basis 
and um, and and with the emphasis on technology, um, uh, you know, reclaim a, a share and 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 get competitive for certain ship types uh, in the international trades, and, and and get ready to scale up significantly if that is ever what's needed. In your report, you specifically illustrate the example of resupply in Ukraine um, from a land-based logistics perspective as an example of how key supply is during 21st century conflict. I'm curious if we're thinking about the maritime side of things, how does the issue of secure supply supply lines, supply chains, et cetera, um, play into things? Because obviously in the case of Ukraine, a central advantage the West and NATO broadly has is obviously those supplies are moving through um, Western NATO countries. So there's like a physical limit, or at least there's a strategic limit on what Russia can do to impede the delivery of said supplies. How does that work in a Pacific context where the maritime challenges, I'm sure, are just tenfold as difficult? Yeah, it really is. I remember meeting uh, with the Armored Futures Command a couple of years ago and, and, uh, um, you know, s- s- almost seeing in their face how how concerning this is because the resources aren't there now, um, and and they've had to we have to rely on allies. We have to, and and that doesn't change with anything that I proposed. Um, uh, but um, we need a lot more American resources that we can depend on. And when you think about how a, a war, I mean, the war games are are almost infinite in terms of how this could play out in a in a Taiwan scenario, if it's a short you know, violent uh, um, uh, conflict that's over in, 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 in days or weeks, um, resupply during the conflict is not going to be an issue. Uh, but we sort of thought that would be the case with uh, Ukraine. And we discovered uh, a month or two into it that logistics was the most important thing. And Russia's failure to handle logistics was the most important thing. So in a Western Pacific conflict where maritime logistics would be so important, um, uh, uh, as you point out, I, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the notion of having a more prolonged conflict and how we deal with all of that, along with sort of the, the, the uh, pro- provocations short of, of actual conflict, um, uh, gray zone tactics that uh, could be applied, uh, quarantine, um, a blockade. There's a, conversations about uh, Taiwan's uh, extreme dependence on waterborne shipments of petroleum and natural gas, le- liquefied natural gas. Uh, Ninety, I think, ninety-seven percent of their energy production is based upon uh, that source of, of fuel, and um, and that's vulnerable. That's vulnerable to interdiction by by China uh, if they choose to do so. If you so if. One scenario would be is if you if you shift the um, uh, supply some of the supply from the United States, we have plenty of petroleum and LNG. We could ship over there, and if we put it on a U.S. flagship, um, uh, that's a much more uh, uh, su- secure and reliable uh, supply chain uh, that Taiwan can rely upon. Much more complicated for China to mess with that. Something I want to get to, um, and I think this is particularly fascinating in this conversation is the, as we saw earlier, the definition of who we is, um, is mixed. So you have, you have industry, merchant marine, um, federal government, state governments, but you also have labor unions. You've ref- referenced labor unions. Um, where does that labor side of things fit into the picture we're describing here when it comes to interlocking all the various parts of this ecosystem together? Well, uh, they're critical. I mean, they are, they are the core of certainly what I see as the, as the, um, uh, as as the uh, a plan to to move this industry uh, toward readiness, um, the, the readiness we need to achieve. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we need to go from four thousand roughly uh, deep sea commercial mariners today to ten thousand. Um, that's that's the kind of growth that um, you know labor unions you know w- would die to get. I mean, it's it's very very attractive. We're not doing it because we want to support or create jobs or, or support labor unions. We're doing it because the country needs it, um, and, um, and and so it's it is it is imperative that. Uh, um, that, you know, the labor unions, uh, you know, work together with, uh, uh, companies and with the government to, um, uh, really respond to this challenge effectively. I, th- now I, the report included a, a provision, um, that is controversial, uh, and that is, that concerns a, a second American registry. 
uh, which is um, uh, labor unions don't like. Um, I understand why. I was well aware of their concerns and, and, and tried to structure it so that it would address those concerns uh, in the report. Um, um, that that prompted a response that uh, I think and is And sorry, could you explain, um, despite being an interested party, sure. to the degree to which you can, what's the labor union objection? What are the understandable concerns that you notice? And then what's your response therein? Sure. So, so uh, a second registry is basically uh, a, a, a mechanism for uh, uh, ships uh, to uh, have an agreement with the U.S. government um, that would, uh, but to be crewed by non-U.S. citizens. And so, um, the, so, so, so the idea of having a, a small, a, a controlled fleet of second registry ships is that uh, you would have uh, ships in international markets pr uh, protecting uh, global supply chains, uh, uh, addressing uh, gray zone activities, not responsible for the core military sea lift uh, role, but but sort of secondary security roles that are critical, and and, and that um, and we we are not going to get five hundred. U.S. flag, U.S. crewed ships. So we've got a we've got a big gap there, and this is one way to c cover it. Now, the labor union's objective is they're not they're American ships, but they're not crewed by American citizens. Um, that's um, uh, that is a, that just you know that's a, uh, contrary to a peg in the ground as far as labor is concerned, and I understand that. Uh, I guess my response to that is you know there's more to it. What 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 we're really talking about is shifting 250 ships that are now foreign-owned, foreign-crewed, uh, have no uh, commitment whatsoever to the United States into a status that, that does provide security, uh, enhance our, our security. And, um, and, I think, uh, and I think in that sense, and then again with the, the safeguards that are in the, in the plan itself, uh, should, if anything, enhance um, uh, labor's um, um, ability to um, uh, enhance labor's uh, role in in all of this so um, I think I, I think more conversation needs to be needs to take place around this issue so for the final broad question I'd love just to hear um, given this is a, a lengthy report that we can't summarize in a you know uh, 35 40 minute or so podcast I'd love to hear just your closing takeaway for pop for policymakers and interested persons in the industry who need to pick up um, on the topics that you're hitting on in the report. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I think shipping and shipbuilding are, are uh, the, the strategic industry most uh, where we're most overmatched by China. We can do something about it uh, fairly quickly and, and, and make a meaningful change. Um, it, you know, if legislation is done, agreed to and done, uh, you know, within the next uh, two years, we can, we can start to turn it around uh, by the end of this decade, uh, we would have a 500 ship American American ship fleet, um, and that you know on a on a global fleet of 55,000, it doesn't sound that big, but um, but when you start sort of slicing of where those ships are and where we're needed, uh, and there's different ship types that uh, uh, could be included in this fleet, it could make a real meaningful difference in our security, and it's it, it's it is analogous to the microchip. Uh, 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 act and and the need to reclaim a, a a more significant share of the market. So we have assured access. Microchip bill is about getting assured access to some of, of the most advanced microchips that are made in the United States. It's going to take five years to get there, but we're going to get there, and that's going to be twenty percent, twenty five percent of the market eventually. Um, if we can look at shipping in the same way and shipbuilding in the same way where we're going to get from where we are today, which is 0.04% of U.S. import export trades to 10%, 15% through a 500 ship fleet uh, that is, you know, curated to be the most strategically valuable to our, our national security interests, um, uh, you know, soon and, and certainly by the end of the decade, um, what a difference that would make, I think, in our security posture in this sector. That is an excellent place to end. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on Arsenal of Democracy. Thank you for having me, Marshall. Great to see you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. 
If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.